Good evening, adventurers, and welcome to today's episode of Goodberry Cafe. Goodberry Cafe is the little warm cafe where everyone is welcome to come in and pull up a chair. Today we're serving up a cup of inspiration, so I hope that you'll come in and stay a while. My name's Jem, and I'll be your host. For anyone who's new this evening, Goodberry Cafe is an interview show where I'll be chatting with guests who have a variety of different geeky, nerdy, artistic hobbies and passions about the things that they do, the things that they love, the things that they create, the communities they're a part of, and how all of those things affect them and others positively. This show is a warm, safe, inviting space where we invite you, our listeners, to learn about these various hobbies and activities and maybe just find and learn about a new adventure for you to try to. So today I am honored to get a chance to talk about Burning Man, or that crazy wild thing in the desert, with John Halcyon Spin who happens to be one of the first people who comes up when you search Burning Man videos online. Um, Halcyon has been storytelling online for over 20 years through writing, live streams, and his YouTube channel, Cognation. He's also the author of Protagonist and Love More, Fear Less, Float More, Steer Less. In the Burning Man world, he is the co-founder of the Pink Heart theme camp, and in the default world, he's an authenticity coach and runs the First Saturdays Homeless Outreach Organization. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about Burning Man, reflect a little bit on this year's burn, and hear some wisdom about running a theme camp and his thoughts on the future of the event. So uh, Halcyon, thank you so much for joining me today. Before we get into the questions, would you mind introducing yourself and telling the viewers a little bit about you? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Um, let's see. Uh, I. It is hard for me to separate who I am from Burning Man. I discovered Burning Man and the internet about the same time in the late 90s. And in a really fortunate way, as I was trying to figure out who I was, these two budding movements uh, were both teaching in different ways how to find freedom and you know personal expression and really liberation in different ways um now we could i don't think we have time to get into how the internet maybe let us down in some ways but <laughs> at the time there was this promise and maybe we could talk about how burning man maybe has not fulfilled all its promises but i still am a believer and so burning man then became something that has informed my personal growth uh and what i really it's funny like i it, it's, it's in i believe uh that there is a lot that the world needs healing with. And I don't think Burning Man is the only way that we can heal the world, but it's the best way that I know uh, as far as giving people permission to access their gifts and then share those with the world. So my, I've made it my passion to help people figure out what their gifts are, encourage them and support them in sharing that with the world. And then a big part of who I am and what I do is sharing my journey doing that, including all of the struggles that I have, because I feel like too often we have guides or teachers that present as if they have an answer. And I don't think there is a person like that out there. I don't think there is a guru that does not sometimes lose their temper. Not that I've met, you know, I have never met the Dalai Lama. Uh, I've never uh, met Eckhart Tolle. Um, but the people that have guided me have been ones who are very human. People like Ram Das or uh, uh, people like my grandpa even, and maybe we can get more into to that. But so I, I try to be the kind of human that inspires me, which is someone who's doing their best, but sometimes fails. Radically human. At least. Yes. <laughs> oh. So you said you got into the Burning Man culture in the 90s. Uh, what first drew you into the culture? So I actually, I, I was in a point in my life where I was just trying to say yes to new adventures. A lot more courageous than I am now, I think. But <laughs> uh, I, and I was involved with this early internet kind of um, content creator community. It was a much smaller web at the time. So if people were making their own original content, we tend to find each other, communicate through um, mailing lists. And uh, and there was 
a person that I met through the mailing list named Derek Powazic, who had a site called Fray.com that was massively influential with the early interactivity of the web. And so we met through some conferences and things and my site at the time was really, he said, knowing the kind of out there-ness that I was trying to access, he goes, you know what you would really like? <laughs> And I was like, uh, I mean, there's not a lot online about it. There's not a lot. So, but I, I, I knew that you dressed funky. There was possibly naked people there and there was a bunch of art and it was in the desert. And so <laughs> I said, sure, you know, I actually, so I went with my friend Darren and my brother. We borrowed my mom's car, not knowing that we were going to destroy oh, no. it. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and we actually showed up on Thursday of the event, which is, if you are a veteran, you know that that's like, serious weekender weekend warrior <laughs> yeah that is, that, there's no pride in saying that you showed up on thursday but i didn't you know i didn't know and so it's actually something that i think about a lot now as i see people who are start, are critical of newbies or people that don't understand the 10 principles it's also why i've dedicated a huge part of my life to trying to educate people about the 10 principles and get people from that place of like mind blown to getting it so that you can become a participant. I mean, I think the quicker that path goes, the faster people become part of their own healing and the healing of the planet. Mm -hmm. And so like the, 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 there's a moment that my life changed, which my first year walking out onto the playa with my friend Derek, who invited me and seeing the scope of it, which is something that you can watch all my videos. You watch, you know, <laughs> hundreds of hours of videos and you will not be prepared for the scope of and the size and the scale and, and the the immense amount of energy and resources that people put into building things. And I'm looking at all these incredible sculptures and things and, and I said, so wait, so so my ticket price is distributed amongst all these artists to build this stuff? And he's like, oh, oh no, 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 no. These people have been fundraising all year for the opportunity to blow your mind. And in that moment, <laughs> I was like, I'd, I'd never been exposed to, to a motivation in people that was outside of our traditional system of transactions. And so to see it so profoundly, I'm getting like tingles thinking about it. like, <laughs> I, I changed my life. I was like, okay, this, I, I want, I want to give to this, you know? And so from then on, you know, whenever I had more resources or more time or more thoughts, it was like, well, how can I invest that into blowing people's minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll never forget uh, my first burn. I didn't set up my camp till nighttime. Uh, so my camp lead at the time was like, okay, just throw your stuff together. Like we're going, it's nine o'clock. You need to see this. Uh, and he brought, brought, brought me out into the Esplanade and I'll never forget that moment. Just like seeing just the Esplanade all, all glow everything lit up and how big everything was it was oh, it's magic. A, I mean, it, it's like it's <laughs> more amazing than the Vegas strip i mean it is it is it is inc it is and w w when you until you go you think you've been to a festival or you you've been to a camp out and you're like yeah yeah i get it and then you see it and you're like it, yeah so maybe it's <laughs> not worth talking about too much but it is it is it is a a expression of humans that is beyond anything I think that the planet has ever seen. And so to, to witness it, the other thing that happens, I think when you witness it, first thing you do is you're like, wow, I feel so lucky to, to, to be able to experience this because not everybody can, you know, it's, it sells out. It, it, you, you can't get a ticket without a lot of work and maybe making connections and connecting with artists and finding a way to make yourself valuable to the event. But I think that what, happens and happened to me and I think to many people is you well let me I won't say it happens to everyone I will say it happened to me and I try to encourage people to recognize that you are so lucky to witness this and there is a responsibility to that and so a lot of people go and then they can't wait for a year later when they get to go again and I'm like no that's not enough like you have a responsibility to be an ambassador of that and bring it to the world, even though it's, it takes courage. But that's part of, I think, my dharma and my mission is trying to 
remind people of that responsibility. Mm -hmm. And you've done so much work with uh, all of your your YouTube series, um, and you're you're known really to give those Burning Man tips and bits of wisdom uh, through the internet. So, do you have a piece of advice that you were given that has stuck with you all these years? That's hard. I mean, I think <laughs> because I feel like so much of of the insight of the burn is experiential. I will say that that, that thing I shared about that that where the my where Derek told me, no, these people are have been you know fundraising to blow your mind. That was one of those things of like, oh, that really changed it for me. As far as the advice that someone else gave me. Um, Yes. Okay. I will say there's one thing, which was before I was leading theme camps, I was in a number of theme camps. And one of the camps I was in was called Zara. And it was, we were at two, two o'clock Esplanade, which if you've been to the burn, you know, that is like a, the most biggest, most visible sound camp, which are usually the biggest, most crazy, you know, camps on Playa. And so, although the scale of them was different then than they are now, uh, which I think is a good thing, but in any case, it was still like a massive undertaking with huge amounts of human hours. And we we didn't finish our build when the burn opened. We didn't finish Monday, we didn't finish Tuesday, but Wednesday night we opened for the, and had one night open. <laughs> and then the, the biggest storm I've ever been in at the Burning Man happened and destroyed our oh, camp, no. like destroyed it. Oh, Metal no. pipes bending and flying through the air. We had live sawed in our in our fully enclosed camp, which is no longer allowed because of <laughs> us. And so the whole thing was destroyed. Neon ballasts are flying everywhere. Miracle that no one was hurt. Oh my goodness. So then the next day, as we were in the wreckage, and two things happened. I'm sitting there with my campmates crying. And the first thing that happened was these two very attractive, well-costumed, I won't say costumed, well-outfitted um, two young women, they rode up and they're like, can you guys tell us where Zara is? And I was like, this is Zara, you know? And they were like, oh, okay. And they rode away. And I was like, where are you? What? Like, why won't you stay and suffer with us? <laughs> and I was like, oh. Oh, wait, I'm choosing to stay in this suffering. Like I'm so attached to the way I think it's supposed to be that I can't let go and, and embrace something new, something amazing. Burning Man was still happening for everybody else. I just was stuck uh, in that not letting go of the way it's supposed to be. And the other than like exclamation point on the same experience was then our camp lead, Mark Hinckley came out and he passed last year, but it was an amazing guy. And he comes out and he's looking it over and, and we were all like crushed and he spent twice the time and energy that we did. And he looks out, he's got a cigarette and he goes, and we're like, oh, what's he gonna say? Oh, poor guy. And he goes, well, this just shows that mother nature is the one directing this play. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, fucking A, mm -hmm. yeah. And since then, I think, you know, I mean, that taught me harder than any other year, which is an important reminder when things are bad, bad at Burning Man, it doesn't mean that they are not incredibly valuable, which I've had to try to remember this year. Yes. I was say, <laughs> this year, this year for me, I feel like I learned that lesson. <laughs> surrender. I mean, I think yeah. surrender is the core lesson of Burning Man. And if you can really embrace surrender, you can start to see the gifts of life that your narrative or your societal narrative or your expectations make you blind to because we have cognitive bias you know we have minds that do not let us see things that we're not looking for unless we really actively practice so that's part of you know my personal practice the things that i try to teach through my coaching and through gratitude circles and all sorts of things is like how do we break out of the limitations of our brains so that we can surrender and see gifts that we couldn't normally see. I love that. Um, 
I know that a lot of uh, our viewers have not been to Burning Man and they tend to see the media portrayals and the articles about it. Um, so if you, if you had to briefly, I know you probably talk a lot about this, if you had to briefly describe what Burning Man was to you, uh, what would you say? I mean, I don't blame anyone who makes a judgment on what they think it is. You know, in the same way that, I mean, people who generally will judge me, they'll see a picture of me and they will have an assumption of the kind of person I am or, or how I'm a narcissist or something like that. You know, and I, 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 I could see how you could make that on a, on a judgment. And the same way, like Burning Man, like it's, it's, there's so much dramatic visuals of fire and people that are in crazy outfits and, and then our media and especially like Instagram and things like that, we reward people's behavior. And so people are attracted to things that are fairly shallow often. Mm -hmm. And so those things get bumped in algorithms and we get these warped concepts of the world, which is a huge problem way beyond Burning Man and actually is so damn dark that avenue that I'm going to pull back now and say, how would I describe Burning Man? <laughs> uh, which is, it is a temporary city that attracts the most interesting people in the world to gift their talents. And so you have 80,000 people all trying to figure out how could they make this city better? And that means performers, musicians, scientists, lecturers, uh, yogis, um, everything. And, and masseuse, you know, uh, massage therapists, you know, people who have, talents and and gifts that you've never heard of you know weird sock puppet reiki you know things that you, know, you just don't <laughs> and so part of it is you get to witness and and be gifted these things all without any sort of transactional nature no no funds no no tit for tat no equaling the ledger just people trying to give their gifts and then recognizing the joy of that when you get to see your gifts light someone up and make their life better you feel that joy and when you, and so the, the 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 massive impact of this city is that we get snapped out of transactional thinking, which most of us have never lived outside of it. You don't even understand what that means until you start to ex experience it, and then you get snapped out of this old belief pattern teaching that the way to get happier is to add to yourself, to to get things, to get money, to get status, to get whatever. But the reality is that gives you a target zone for your joy of just you. And that's incredibly limiting. It's the reason why so many people hit these walls of, you know, despair. When you get taught about gifting and you start to realize that your joy can be actually increased by making lives better of anyone, then your target zone is magnified and multiplied by billions. And it changes your life and it changes the way I think that you have hope. Agree with that. So Burning Man is to me, and the reason why I've invested so much into it is, is, is that, is that it is this classroom to learn the life-changing lesson of gifting. And so when people ask me what my favorite principle is, Burning Man is governed by 10 principles. There's, I mean, I, how do I, how do I describe <laughs> Burning Man? It, it is, but it, it's, it's governed by 10 principles that are uh, things like, gifting, decommodification, radical self-reliance, radical inclusion, civic responsibility, leave no trace. And each of these, you know, we could talk about for hours, but the, 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 they work together and they're kind of sometimes confusing, but what they are are guidelines for personal responsibility, personal expression, and supporting a community that makes an incredibly fertile ground for uh, inspiration and growth. And I'll just keep on that. Why I think that's so important is, as I mentioned, I think the, the world has some things that aren't working. I don't think that's a bold statement. Um, and as Buckminster Fuller, I believe is the one who said that, you know, we cannot solve the problems of the world with the thinking that got us into them. And unfortunately we have a, a system that has Edu an educational system and a socialization system that does not encourage people to access true inspiration. Mm -hmm. It encourages us to 
fall into a certain type of thinking to figure out how we can be good consumers, how we can fit in and not disrupt these systems that don't, don't serve the individual and are not healing the planet and are not healing things like you know income inequality and things like that. Yeah. So if there is a way to get us out of those things, it's not gonna happen through our systems. If it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen when people allow deep divine inspiration to come out. And Burning Man is the, the best place that I know, not the only place. I think any place that you are supported as an individual, whether that is your knitting group or Comic-Con or anything, like Juggalos, any place that says, whatever you are authentically, we love that. Then you start to not push down the divine inspiration and you let it out. And sometimes what you let out is a uh, sock puppet Reiki. You know, <laughs> sometimes it's erotic poetry and sometimes it's some way of accessing a new type of solar technology. Sometimes it's who knows? And we just don't have the thinking to know what divine inspiration is going to make a difference. And so having these safe, fertile places that let these things come out is the only, that's where my faith is. I mean, that's what keeps me from despair is thinking that maybe, maybe there's a chance within these incredible humans that are accessing their genius. I actually, uh, I call the burn every year, my little dose of medicine. Um, and it makes me fall in love with humanity again, year after year, just seeing the, seeing the doses of connection that happen there and seeing the magic that people can create when just, when they just create what they want. Um, yeah. It's beautiful. I, I gotta get you a, a sticker. I make these stickers that say, I don't know if it'll show it. It says, you are okay. the medicine the world needs. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talking about gifting, I got the pleasure of watching one of your talks at Utopia a couple years back, like five or, I don't know, four years back or so. Um, and you were talking about gifting and you mentioned that gifting should, should be a plus one, should always be a plus one. Um, and that's a lesson that has stuck with me since that talk. And I, when I talk to my campers, I, I run my own theme camp now. And so when I'm acculturating my, my new campers to Burning Man, I always talk about that plus one aspect when I get to gifting. Um, so how did you, how did you develop that, that idea and that concept uh, for yourself? I, I think, I mean, the, 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 the challenge in talking about gifting is that people have never been outside of transactional thinking. So it's like, how can I explain this? It's like, there's a great uh, David Foster Wallace, I think his name is, talks about this is water, where yes. this incredible con uh, commencement speech that you should look up, but he's you know, like, how does a fish understand that it's in water? And how do you know that you are in a transactional system? Um, and so I, I, I try to explain like, like when you are going through the world, you are generally in a, balance the ledger system so plus one minus one so if you trade your money for jewelry it's worth one it's not you know it's plus one minus one okay the ledger is even and people think oh burning man's like barter right like no barter is still transactional it's still my shells are worth this and your jewelry is worth the same and so it's plus one minus one zero where gifting is is that plus one it's more like Christmas morning when you buy a gift for a child, they open it and they're like, oh, plus one. And it makes you so excited to see them happy. So you get plus one. So now instead of equal, you have a plus one, plus one, you've got this plus two. And when you have tens of thousands of people, not just getting to a, some zero, but getting plus two with every interaction, plus two, plus two, plus two, plus two, plus two. Plus two. And then hopefully being inspired to recognize that you can do that year round. That is legitimately world changing. I agree. I love Woo! that. I love that lesson. <laughs> um, you also, another one of your, your talks that, that stuck with me. I remember you released this video um, where you kind of challenged the idea of what an artist is and what a gift is. Uh, and you had mentioned things like uh, organization or uh, setting up lights 
could be construed as a gift or your art. Um, and I just want to personally thank you for that. Uh, Cause I remember when I stumbled upon that video, I was preparing for the burn and doing a bunch of last minute things for the event that I host every year. And uh, I remember when I found that I was feeling, feeling some feels uh, like what I was contributing was not enough um, because it wasn't what is typically considered art. Uh, so I'm not good at painting, like I don't sing, I don't perform, uh, but what I can do is like organize. Uh, and so I, and I can lead people. Uh, so when I found that video, it was just super influential for me. Um, and it really helped reframe my perspective uh, as to what an artist is and what a gift could be. Uh, and so I realized that what I bring to the playa every year is my art. It is my, my gift. Uh, so how did you first reframe that perspective of what could be considered art for yourself? I think in, in, the, in the, my early days at Burning Man, I, I just got exposed to so many different types of people that were lead, leading so many different types of artistic lives. And I think many of us were brought up in a model of the world that uh, where artists are separate from the rest of us who are consumers mm -hmm. and it's professional artists and, and uh, the book Big Magic by Elizabeth who did Eat, Pray, Love I'll blink but her book Big Magic is an incredible book about creativity and she talks about how in our, in our culture we we have a point in kids lives where we we kind of decide can you make a month can you make a living creating art mm -hmm. and if you aren't a good enough singer or a good enough painter then we say well then stop wasting your time on this go into a craft you know make money so then 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 you outsource creativity you 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 give your money to professional artists to create things and you work on anything else but that helps the system and make money for others and and so the book is like humans are creators we're monkeys that make things you know <laughs> 200 years ago if you wanted you know a piece of furniture you made it if you wanted to make your belt have designs on it you figured out how you're gonna you know mess with the leather on it you know, we were the creators and so it was a tragic shift when we started to outsource that to this creative class and so i think that part of burning man is starting to see that you can add to the creativity of the world in an infinite number of ways. And so this idea that art is the things that are confined by the frame of a painting or on a pedestal at, a, at an art museum are just so limiting. And so the, the idea of starting to see people whose lives were creative and people who were making decisions from this active creative space where the output wasn't necessarily a physical piece of art, but it was a world that was more authentic or more beautiful or more something real. And so that started to make me think that, because I didn't feel like I was a painter or a <laughs> dancer or anything like that, but I, I started making business cards that said lifestyle artist. And I said, okay, I'm gonna just try to live my life in a way where I'm walking the walk of the things I believe in and, and making decisions from a place of authenticity and trying to be the most authentic version of myself. And so once I started to practice that, I, it became clearer and clearer that there's, there is, there, everyone is an artist when they are expressing authentically. And there's no judge, there's no jury, there's no curator that can say that's not worthy, that's not, artistic not if it's real if it's real it's beautiful i really agree with that and thank you again helped open my eyes <laughs> uh so when so you are also a theme camp organizer you run pink heart uh what what inspired you to make that jump from just attending to actually helping organize your own camp so actually the, the, my, my second year i i met up with some local San Diegans that had been to Burning Man the year before. And 
this is a less of a thing now, but in in 89, when I got back from Burning Man, it was like, <gasps> Every you have to know Burning Man. And it was like, <laughs> what? Like, stop talking about this. So you, we quickly found the other people in the city who had been, and we got together and we, we did a theme camp together, which was pretty, a low bar considering what people do now and what I have taken on over the last, you know, 15 years or so. And so then, uh, I, I was a kind of co-lead for a number of camps, one called Lust Monkeys. Then we joined up with Zara, and we're Lust Monkeys of Zara, um, and then helped start a camp, co-founded a camp called Backcountry, and then co-founded Pink Heart. So I've kind of been involved with leadership for a long time, but Pink Heart was the first one where I said, like, I have a vision. I am, have enough courage to say, Black Rock City needs this, you know? Now, it wasn't like, I have a vision, I'm so attached to it, everybody, here's my my blueprint, make this. It was more like, I wanna head in this direction, who thinks that's a good direction? And then people started going, well, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. And I said, that's cool as long as it's pink. That was, <laughs> that was the basic rule for, for the camp. And, and so when Pink Art came to be, we actually, I had a year at Backcountry where everyone was allowed to kind of bring whatever you wanted. And so I had a pink lounge there that was the yeah. prototype of, of, of what Pink Heart became. It was just this little bitty one shade structure with some pink fabric on it. And then uh, and then I'm like, well, let's make a whole camp around this. And so that Pink Heart became that. And the more we thought about that, it was like, well, what does that mean? What is what is what is it about? What are we what's the vibe? What's the, what are we trying to create? And the way that we kind of think about it is that um, like if there's a humanitarian crisis in the world, you go to the Red Cross. But if there is a crisis of the spirit, then you go to Pink Heart. And so we try to be a place that is a lighthouse for body, mind, spirit. So we are, from its, our inception, we were designed to be a camp on the Esplanade where we have a bright pink beacon, bright light beacon at night and daytime so that if you're lost out on playa you can try to recalibrate so if you're, <laughs> you're if you're lost physically we help you to recalibrate where you are if you get dehydrated and your body's biology is out of whack we have ice water to recalibrate your body and then we have the pink fur couches that look out over the open playa so if you're disoriented and out of whack with your spirit or your loneliness or need a friend or want to talk to someone we have a place to recalibrate your spirit as well. So that's been kind of the vision that then has been executed in all different directions as different people bring their genius and bring their art and bring their uh, inspiration to this general idea. And the things that are part of it is that we, we, we never have really loud music mm. and we have the lighting is really dialed in to be kind so that it's a place where people can have conversations day and night one of the real big desires of creating the space was that I, I, I love everything at Burning Man. I love the art. I love the music. I love all of it. But the thing I love the most is the people. And the thing that I crave the most is, is connecting with people and having conversations. And often I would find, especially late at night, people are drawn to the blinky lights and the thump, thump, thump. Yeah. And you meet, so you see like, oh, this person looks interesting. You go, hey, I and they go, what? <laughs> And I go, I got it in a, a thread story. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and so I'm like, could we make a place where you can just quietly Hello. say, hi, I love those shoes. And you go, thank you. You mind if I sit down? Actually, I'm kind of going through something. Okay, awesome. Have a beautiful night. You know? Or, yeah, please, I would love to tell you about my day. Like, yes, tell me what just blew your mind in this incredible place. And so the, the, and, and building a reputation of that over years, it has become uh, a really important place to a lot of people where these kind of magical, safe connections happen with strangers or with loved ones. I mean, the number of people that have gotten engaged at, at, at Pink Heart after they met someone at Pink Heart the next year, and then the year after that, they got married there. It's like, <laughs> it's one of the most rewarding things. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And so as a theme camp organizer, um, I'm seeing that is is magical uh, in that space that you, you created. What would you say are some of your other uh, favorite parts of being an organizer? Um, it builds up your resilience. 
Um, <laughs> no, I, 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 it is, it is the most challenging and the most rewarding job in the world. Um, sometimes people say like, well, do you get a chance to go out and experience, you know, Black Rock City? I'm like, I mean, I could more if I want to, but there's no joy greater than knowing that you are contributing to people's experience at the most incredible city in the world that the, in my mind, the world's ever seen. And so knowing that you are contributing to making the most incredible place the world's ever seen better or what it is like, that is a state of joy and purpose that is so hard to achieve in our world. So just tuning into that awareness and gratitude is, is I think one of the most powerful things about being a theme camp organizer. Now, now I also feel like I'm really blessed that because of the amount of time that I've spent, you know, being a part of this community and um, that I'm really blessed that, that I have an incredible team of people that work at Pink Art and that we have a pretty good reputation. So we tend to get a lot of visitors. Um, and I've learned a lot of lessons over the last 24 years of, of doing this thing. So it is not, not everybody has as smooth an experience running a theme camp. And I will say that knowing that it is not smooth running Pink Art. It is fucking hard. And inevitably somebody gets pissed. You know, I every year have to eat pro and say, I could have done this better and have people that sometimes they qu quit the camp with a lot of rage and anger. And it's, it's every year I'm like, I, I'm not, a, not again, nah, no. Yeah. But I keep having this realization of like, well, what better use of my energy is there in the world? I don't know. Um, so so my, my heart goes out to people that take on running a theme camp and then don't have the amount of affirmations that I'm so lucky to get. Because sometimes you, have, you, you get back from the burn and you do not feel like the, the, the gifts were worth the, the cost. Yeah. But I think the other, I mean, that, that's true, I think, with almost everything in life, and the theme camps are maybe a good instructor for this, is that you got to get out of that transactional mentality where you don't, you don't give things, you don't gift, you don't show kindness so that you can get the rewards from it. Hopefully you do get rewards, but you do it because it's who you are. And when you know that that's who you are in the world, and that's the person you are, and that's the way that you show up, and that's how you use your energy. Even though it doesn't feel as good to not get the recognition, you still have to, or you get to sleep at night, sleep at the end of your year, and go to the end of your life going, that's who I was in the world. That's who I was. Yeah. I know, um, I know that, that all too well. On my camp, yeah. I have, I have instituted a thing called Self-Care Wednesday because I always would have breakdown Thursday where it's just <laughs> everything just builds up and for some reason it's always on Thursday so now we do self-care Wednesday where we, we try to save save off a uh, breakdown Thursday <laughs> um, yeah it's it's uh, it, anything you can do to avoid the total collapse of people by the time you have to strike your camp which if you're not strike is what you we call when you break down the camp and it is a grueling endeavor usually and most people after a week of survival have some story in the back of their mind that like, well, I'm more tired than everyone else. So I don't have to do as much as like, ugh. yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned having, so having like a great team that you can rely on. Uh, so my, my camp is only this year was its second year at the burn. It's existed in other iterations at Utopia and other events, but um, this is only our second year placed at the burn. Uh, so I'm still very early in the process of building my team. Do you have any advice on how, advice for me on how I can best find those gems of people to help uh, make this dream come, come alive? I can, I can, I can say, do what I say, not what I do, or what I'm <laughs> practicing, I'm trying to be better at. Mm -hmm. Um, for the, for a long time, I was scared to ask people 
and, and say, will you take on this responsibility? And so I often would say, who can do this? Who will do this? And the, the, the tr what I'm learning and I'm practicing and I'm trying to practice and study people like Brene Brown, um, who has, is an incredible guide as far as leadership and authenticity, but, but this idea that, that I, I know that when I have stepped up to responsibly in the past, it's often because someone I respect says, you could do this. You'd be awesome at this. Would you do this? Which is a vastly different feeling than a open question and you saying, I'll do it. You know, then, then, then it almost like, you're like, what if, what if you say, I'll do it and someone's like, oh gosh, okay. <laughs> Good luck, yeah. Then, then, you know, if you fail, it's like, oh my God, I shouldn't have said yes to this. You know, but if, if someone says you could do this and then you fail, it's like, hey man, thanks for, thanks for doing your best. You know, you, you know, or hey, how can we give you more support in this? Or it's just a different feeling. So I am trying to be better at, and so that guidance I would give is, is see people that you respect or that you see their commitment or their talents and you said and, and and really risk putting them in an awkward situation risk them having to say oh i don't want to do that you know because i'm always afraid of making someone feel uncomfortable because i don't like to feel that uncomfortable but you have to go to those uncomfortable places say would you do this you'd be great and then people feel the pride they feel that you trust them and uh and I think that's how you, how you build a team. Again, I'm not great at this. I'm really lucky that the vision of Pink Art has been strong enough that incredible people have said, I'll do it when, when we, when I say, would anybody like to do this? You know, um, so it's, it's, again, through like, Byron, I mean, excuse me, through a Brene Bound, I'm trying, and I've learned that the, the truly exceptional leaders are the ones who inspire people to be better leaders themselves. And, and so having the courage to do that is, is the way to get the, the you know, teams that are awesome. Thanks for that. I'm going to keep that. <laughs> uh, they call it, what do they call it? It's called like a, a, there's a term for it. It's like voluntell someone to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I do want to talk about this year's burn a little bit, and for for everyone I know, it wasn't it wasn't just just us. It was one of the hardest burns that they've had. Um, for me, it definitely was. And hot temperatures, dust storms, bumpy roads. Uh, the exodus was a mess, uh, leave, which is the process where you leave the city. Um, my my big party that I do to kick off my week long event got cut in the middle because apparently there was 50 mile per hour winds coming through. So we shut down, and kicked everyone out. The night of lightning. And then yeah. nothing happened at my camp. Yeah. So we shut down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we were, we were struggling a bit. Um, but it's so easy to focus on the negative things that happened and the struggles uh so to start our conversation about this year's boom i do want to shift or shift the perspective a little bit uh, what were some of your favorite moments of this year's burn well let me let me actually take a step back and, and and talk to what you said about how difficult it was because um i think the other part of it was that we'd been off for three years and so a lot happened in that time um, one was that our need for it was greater. You know, I find that like when, when the pandemic first started and we had to go to staying indoors and talking to webcams and communicating through uh, Zoom and less socializing, I was like, that's easy for me. I never leave the house. I talk through <laughs> a webcam all the time. Like this is easy until it came down to Burning Man because Burning Man is when I do leave the house and I connect with the community and I fill up my well with human connection and love and affirmation at everything I've been doing for the past year has been meaningful. And so losing that recalibration and reconnection was devastating to myself and many people. 
And so after multiple years of that, the, the need for it was so strong. And so then to get to Burning Man and the weather be so fucking hot that it was hard to leave the, your camp and events got, were way less attended because who is going out on adventures? So even though we serve ice cream and ice water, people are like, fuck that. I am not going, you know, three blocks away to get that. And so we had way fewer people. And so when you put the same amount of energy and it's harder to do because you're doing it in the heat and then fewer people are attending, it just uh, makes everything so much harder. Um, and so I think that was a big part of all of it is fewer people out and about doing things, uh, the, the weather being so grueling. And then for my personally, I've always struggled with heat um, and it's gotten harder as I've gotten older. Uh, I guess I've already confessed that I've been going to Burning Man for 24 years. So, you know, I'm no spring chicken and heat gets harder for people, some of us old folk. And so it was really difficult for me. And then I also, I don't know exactly what happened to me, but I do an event every year on Thursday at noon. And after that event, I collapsed. So I don't know if I just had heat stroke or if I was dehydrated, if I was feeling the effects of uh, COVID, which I tested for negative on fly, but positive when I got to Reno, or if I had another virus that was going around, but I was l I l passed out or couldn't leave my old RV. I will say RV, people go, oh, you're just hanging on the air conditioning. Now my RV is from 82. So in, in the area of my RV that I had a little portable AC, I could get it down to like 90 degrees in the daytime. But the rest of my RV was 117 degrees during the daytime. And I couldn't leave. I couldn't go to the bathroom. I had I had a campmate bring in a bucket for me so that I could have the shits, you know, for, for hours and hours. <laughs> so I was actually in such a bad way that I wrote out a note and put it in our camp kitchen. I said, somebody come check on me every hour oh, with check boxes for every hour because I was like, if I get any worse, I won't be able to cry for help. And I was scared, really scared. And so, so being at the burn and having you know 48 hours in this state added to this experience of like not having enough socializing and then having the hours that i was able to connect with people reduced to you know almost none so after three years of waiting getting to maybe meet five ten percent of the people i normally would meet on playa it was devastating and so i really had to shift my perspective um, and i think a lot of people did to that surrender that we talked about earlier. You can't always get what you want. Thank you, Mick Jagger. But sometimes <laughs> you get what you need. And that's been the, the big challenge for me, especially when I, so when I got home or I didn't, go, I go to the, to Reno every year after the burn and go to the Grand Sierra Resort, which is, I highly recommend it, super fun, especially if you're a theme cam organizer and you spend all week working. And then it's nice to have a few days in Reno where you're like, Room service, showers, somebody do everything for me. Let me just talk yeah. and hang out with people. <laughs> and so, uh, but when I got to Reno, I, it took me a while to figure this out, but my, my illness on, on Playa became, it was a traumatic event for me. And I couldn't remember anything good that happened to Burning Man. So when you asked me, what, what were the, your highlights? I was like, honestly, initially, I couldn't tell you. I, I could not think of anything except me suffering in my camp and the dark thoughts that I went through. Like I, when I was in my dark night and I couldn't get up to help with camp stuff, I over and over was having these like nightmarish thoughts. And I was like, I have to step down from camp. I have to step down from camp. I don't deserve to be a leader in this camp. I'm not contributing in the level that I have told people that we expect them to. And I have let everyone down and it was so, um, it was so dark that I, I it was traumatic and, and it actually that's actually been a helpful thing for me because I don't associate with specific traumatic events of my childhood although I definitely have had trauma that's a whole different thing that we could talk about mm -hmm. but it helped me to appreciate people's traumatic experiences and how the mind can be so devastated that it's it's not a matter of like snap out of it or well yeah I know that was bad but tell me something good I was like I, 
I literally cannot think of anything. And so luckily I talked to enough people and started going through pictures and started kind of like walking myself back and be like, holy shit, I'd had the pink ride, <laughs> which I've been doing for, I don't know, 15, 16 years. So I'll say that's, that, that was my highlights is, mm-hmm. was getting people together, telling stories about the, my lessons of the year and then going on a bike ride through the city where we say, I love you to everyone we pass. And then we get to center camp and do this big swirling hug. And it's, it is a, it is always a highlight of my year. It's one of the things that inspired Pink Heart was that vibe of that ride. So I'll say that was one of my highlights. And the other highlights was this unexpected and definitely unwanted gift of being unable to, to, to be, a camp lead like I wanted to. And so I had to depend on people in camp. And so I was able to witness people step up and lead and and be, you know, as I was talking about earlier, like, what do you want? What kind of leader do you want to be? People that, in, that, that helps people to be better leaders. And I didn't, it took me being devastated, I think, to really go hands off and say, <laughs> help, please. But I, I wasn't even, I didn't even say it. I just could not get out of bed. So I like, we'd come out of bed and go, oh, everyone's kicking ass. Everything is handled. Fuck yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So that was one of the massive gifts was getting to um, evolve personally in a way that I don't think I could have without the, the challenges. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm happy that you've made it on the other side of that experience and <laughs> so horrible um i can definitely empathize with with the expect sort of like expectations that we had for the event um especially after being disconnected for so long i i think i went through a similar and I, I mentioned I, I i had to learn surrender this year as, through the event too um i for my for the first time i had a camp where i trusted people to lead the event that I I run every day and so I was looking forward to leaving and going to see the city and the weather had different ideas for me so I feel like I barely left camp even though I was so looking forward to like finally getting out during the day um I definitely can relate with that it's so funny like like I have been making videos talking about surrender at Burning Man and how (laughs) it's the core lesson of Burning Man and I make all these videos about, you know, how to survive and all the things you need to do. And I guess somewhere in the back of my mind, I'm like, yeah, but I have this figured out. And so to get spanked so hard, it's like the, like the universe and Burning Man was just like, oh, you, oh, oh, you think you're, you think, oh, you think you're better than surrender. Oh, okay, wham, <laughs> okay, all right. I gotta learn it again, I gotta learn it again. I feel like something a lot of people forget too when they think of the event is that it at its core it is a survival test. It is yes. a test of endurance. It is hard. It's not meant to be easy. Like it's right. not just partying and art and fun. There it is you have to survive out there. <laughs> totally true. And and other thing other thing, like I I I give that advice and I and I still <laughs> I, there was a time when I was in my bed and I was just like I was like <laughs> Anybody that's watched one of my videos and taking my advice, don't listen to me. Save <laughs> <laughs> <Stay> yourself. That's <laughs> 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 um, So, one of the things that I, I I talk to my my camp first timers, my camp virgins with um, their first night out is I ask them to think of this question over the course of the week. Uh, uh, so I asked them, uh, what does the man mean to you? Uh, because I know that I've, in my conversations with people, uh, that ceremony of burning the man, it means something different to every person I talk to. They interpret it differently or feel differently about it. So I ask all my first timers to, to figure that out for themselves. Like think about it th- during the week, go see the man, go see the temple. Uh, and then once the burn's over, I want to know if, if you're well, comfortable sharing with me, what, what did that mean for you, that man? Um, so I want to turn that question to you. Uh, what, what does the, the man mean to you? 
Well, first off, I'll say you sound like an awesome camp lead. <laughs> and if you've got mad skills that you don't want to contribute to Pink Heart, you should contribute to <laughs> Dem's camp. Um, uh, to be totally honest, the man is a less significant part of my burn. Um, after about my 10th year, I stopped going out to watch the man burn, for example. Um, I usually watch it from the Esplanade or from someplace else. It's a, uh, it, the energy is a little intense and unregulated for me. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I, I think of it as the center of our city, you know, this like beacon that uh, we can kind of, in the same way that Pink Heart is a beacon, we also triangulate with the man. You know, there's a yeah. part of, of that. Um, but I think if, if I if I was really pushed to think of it, I think of you know it, it is the it, it is the most central reminder of the transitory nature of of life, and so much of Burning Man, you know, so much of the art that is burnt, which is happening less and less now. So it's actually I think maybe more significant because we are we are more and more encouraged to rethink this idea of burning everything, and that maybe reusing things and being more responsible with resources and carbon and things like that that so the man continues to be this really important symbol of something that does not last does not mean it is without value and something that is beautiful doesn't need to be saved because it is beautiful and that sometimes the most powerful things that we can really embrace is immediacy is the the gift of an experience that we have now i will say though that you know the temple is more important to me you know the, 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 mo the main structures of burning man that are always or have not always been there my first years we didn't have a temple but i don't know how long we've had a temple but there's the man and behind it is the temple the temple is the most significant piece of art i've ever experienced because it is a structure that is as big as a temple that you would see in any country in the world as ornate and beautiful as a structure itself it would make your jaw drop and it's usually done with raw wood and so then over the course of the week once it's constructed tens of thousands of people will write messages that come from their deepest despair and hurt and ache and loss of people that they've lost or something in themselves that they're mourning or trying to let go of. So over the course of the week, you see the most beautiful, authentic, sometimes pained expressions of the human condition. And then at the after the night after the man burns, we burn this structure and to see this thing. I mean, almost anybody, when you see a picture of the burn, they haven't been burning, they're like, like, how can they burn that? You're like, <laughs> because when this thing that is so beautiful and is filled with so much, so many people's energy, when that is ignited and turns to flame into smoke and is released, it is the most powerful human collective expression that I've ever witnessed. It is the most powerful expression of art I've ever witnessed. It changed what I thought art could be. And, and the way that humans can use art to heal and to transcend, you know, their, their experiences as, as a, you know, as a, of suffering, which is life, you know? And so, but as, as a temple, it becomes beautiful and you get to witness the transitory nature of life, the necessary aspect of loss, and that the human experience is one that is not less beautiful because it has lost. It actually is more gorgeous because we have this fluctuation of joy and suffering. And when you can really embrace the intensity of the suffering, you can also witness the intensity of the joy. And to me, the temple and the transitory nature of that is not to answer your question of the man, but that's mm -hmm. part of the man. The temple is that amplified mm -hmm. and and it's 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 a uh, you know there is no one thing that is Burning Man, but it's hard to imagine Burning Man without that. Great, I agree. I always try to um, explain. It's so hard to explain the temple <laughs> yeah. to someone. Yeah. Um, 
it's a it's a space where when you walk even within proximity of it you feel all of that emotion in the air it's heavy in the air i mean look what just happened when i tried to talk about yeah. it yeah i can't not even think about it without starting to feel and the truth is i've had a i had a, a i've had a lot of burner friends Past this year, including one this week. Right. And one of the things that the temple and Burning Man has helped me to do is to realize it. <laughs> I'm not afraid of this feeling and this expression anymore. And I think that part of what we do as humans to feel this way and hopefully give people permission to feel this way is to do so without shame so i'm not going to hold that back i'm going to let that be a part of this moment this immediacy because it's not always dancing <laughs> but i don't feel bad right now i just feel intense right now <laughs> thank you for sharing this authentic authenticity with me Thank you for making me feel safe enough. Um, um, I do, I'm looking at the time. I do want to um, make sure we squeeze in a little bit of talking about the future of Burning Man. Uh, I know that if you Google it, uh, you see that Burning Man is sold out. Um, influencers are ruining the event they've taken over um, Silicon Valley bros are doing everything they're having VIP parties uh, um, and I know for me that's that's not true in my perspective but um, what are your thoughts on the progression of the event well I think um, you know I've, I've witnessed a lot of change in, mm -hmm. in, in the Black Rock City yeah. event over the years. Some things are exactly the same. Some of the the, the, the reasons why it's still world changing, the reason I'm still dedicated to it is because a lot has not changed. Mm -hmm. But I think as far as the future goes and the reason why any major complaints about Black Rock City, we need to think about the regionals. There are hundreds of events around the world where people gather and express themselves in a way that is much more similar to the early days of Burning Man. Or it's still Burning Man, it's just not Black Rock City. It's Burning Man 10 Principles events that are smaller and regional. They're, you know, I was going to say the San Diego one. San Diego was supposed to be this weekend. It has been canceled, but uh, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, but you know, if you go to, I think it's burningman.org slash regionals or just search for Burning Man regionals, there's probably one near you. And so I think the future of, of letting people experience this more raw, more intimate expression is is the future. I mean, one thing that's happened now is that, that Black Rock City is so huge and the, the art and the theme camps are so massive and there's so much resources that you could spend your entire year fundraising and building and making some art and nobody would see it. You know, maybe, but most people, you'd be like, oh, did you see my thing? It was, you know, out by four o'clock and, you know, Pat, they'd be like, <laughs> but if you spend the all year working on a regional, you will impact that event. You will make a difference in everybody that's participated or most people. And I think that that is a really powerful reminder that if you want to really get hit with that feeling of like, is, is my effort, is my art, can it make a difference? Yeah, absolutely. A regional. And the other thing is that I will say that, that, you know, the Black Rock City event has reached a place of scale and size where enough people now know that it is the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> um, now, the downside of that is if you, <laughs> the coolest thing in the world, everybody wants to go to. And if everybody wants to go to it, then the people that have the most resources in the world will find a way there. And that makes it more and more difficult for everyone to go. Certainly everyone can't go. And it makes it more and more frustrating when 
more and more spots there are taken up by billionaires and people that have more resources and it gets frustrating now is it enough to truly change the vibe of the event not enough to make a difference i think the real danger of that billionaire vibe is not the billionaires going because truthfully i want billionaires to get their mind yeah. blown and recognize what gifting is and recognize oh wait a minute you mean if i i can feel as much joy giving this away and making other people's lives better as i could by acquiring yes i want that the danger comes in when people have visions for camps or art that they want to create that is beyond the scope of what the participants of that camp can do themselves and so they outsource to labor and pay that labor and then you have this class system and you have people who are participants or you know taking in like an audience and then you have the people creating it that are paid and the the the, the big danger is in the paid because let's say you are uh we have people in my camp that cook meals and, stuff. and we have people that are you know professionals at doing things and then they gift that to the camp and if you spend all week as a chef for a camp for example and every time people eat you and they love it and you're like yes this feels so good and then you walk down the street and you meet the chef at a neighboring camp and they go oh i got paid 10 grand to cook all these meals for everybody and suddenly that joy that you had two hours ago evaporates and you're like am i a sucker and that is a hugely poisonous vibe to have in the community it's more dangerous than people think you know people say well, what's the big deal that's the big deal if you start to feel that 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 the experience i had my first time on the ply ever where i said who pays these people and the answer was nobody yeah. when you lose the ability to have that answer when you say most of these people aren't paid or some of these people get paid then it's like it's a totally different event and I'm, and I don't mean to say that people should not be paid for their art. You should get paid to bring art to Lightning in a Bottle, to all the festivals all year round that are that are that are have traditional systems of you buy a ticket, you know, and you and you have a curator and you have a producer. But if you can't do something with your team, and then if people say, "Oh, I don't want to do that. Let's outsource it. Go smaller. <laughs> do it. Do less." Yeah. I'd much rather have a smaller event and less ambitious projects and know that everything is being done out of love and the desire to gift. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And I know that something that also comes with with these these changes uh, is losing <laughs> losing those principles too. Like uh, leave no trace, loop everywhere, um, just less of that culture so i know that the burning man org has done a lot of cultural direction setting over the pandemic and they've put teams on it and they've tried to try to make sure that the culture of burning man isn't lost with the growth of the event um so looking at this year's burn do you think that any of their efforts over the pandemic were fruitful i i I don't know. I will say that the, the 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 really challenging struggle is is what I mentioned earlier about it's so awesome that everybody wants to go. And yeah. so when when it, in the older past years of Burning Man, you were brought in by somebody who told you about it. And those people helped you to enculturate you and to tell you this is how you're a good burner. And when you see it talked about in some video where somebody is just showing you know robot heart you know some really incredible sound system and it looks just like a festival and, and big name djs are playing you're like i want to go see the big name djs and see all this cool stuff but no one is there to say you, you do you understand how this happened like the principles are how this happened this is and if people don't make their way through that, which is why I, I try to spend so much energy in that space, but I don't know how you connect with the people that aren't looking for that. Yeah. You know, like, so Burning Man organization can spend all the effort in the world. I can make all the videos in the world, but if somebody isn't looking for those answers, they don't find them. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know what the answer is. I think it is helpful. I think that we have, there is some backfiring that happens, for example, you know, when we, we started to feel like 
one of the challenge the struggles we have with the community is this you know instagram unintentional pr where people <laughs> take pictures of themselves in awesome outfits some of people are people who are influencers mm -hmm. they see burning man as this incredible background for promotional material or their own outfits and jewelry and so people see examples of this commodification of the playa there was a an org effort to say this is a kind of a problem mm -hmm. and then people react way too much in the same way like we had a problem you know 20 years ago with people bringing cheap feather boas to the burn mm -hmm. and during the the cleanup they're like we have a lot of these little bitty feathers so let's we're gonna no more cheap feather boas no more feathers now that rule was eliminated in 2014 <laughs> but if you post a picture of yourself with an outfit with a feather on it today you mm -hmm. will get destroyed people yeah. say blah, 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 you motherfucker you know Bad and like, yeah and and so as the as the org tries to help us be better they also give these rocks to our mo you know mob mentality to attack each other so it's it's a really like so, and this, this is something that's kind of a, become a, 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 an issue for me to talk about a lot this year is there were, there was a meme that went around about this is what this is not Burning Man it was all these people in, yes. in attractive women you know taking their you know, with the beautiful pictures and said these this isn't Burning Man this is Burning Man which is you know art and people dusty and stuff and I understand what they're saying. They're saying, if this is the oh, your only image of Burning Man, that's not what this event is all about. It's also all of these things. But what people see in that is they they see that's what's wrong with Burning Man. And so we, the, the, I started talking about what was problematic with this meme, and the number of women that shared stories of when they were taking pictures of outfits they had made, people would drive by and say. You're ruining Burning Man, you fucking Sparkle Pony, and like really mean, really cruel things. And I talked to the you know women who said I I made this album, but I didn't want to take pictures in it because I didn't want to get you know harassed. And and this isn't just one or two people that look that are professional models. It's lots of women, which is not only is it it's it's misogynist. It fucks with our whole community. The, the, the thing we were talking about earlier, what makes Burning Man magic? That feeling that if I let this expression out, something magical might come out of me. I know as my early days at Burn, before I was making a theme camp, my most significant way of expressing myself was not painting, was not sculpture. It was putting together outfits. And guess <laughs> what? I was in my late 20s. I was working my ass out. I looked fucking awesome. I would, I would train for the Burn, so I looked great <laughs> in my cool outfits. <laughs> That's that was me. I was the Instagram person way before Instagram. Yeah. And guess what? It led to me being the person I am today. And I needed a place that let me get through my insecurity and express safely to get there. And so it's it fucking pisses me off that the number of people, women or otherwise, that potentially are afraid to let that out because the people in our community are going to harass them. Because who knows what magic is being held in when we start curating our own personal expression it is a, it is you can tell in my voice i'm i'm unhappy about it and i think yeah. that if, if cultural correction needs to take a back seat to raw <laughs> hardcore radical self-expression mike throw <laughs> <laughs> definitely agree with you there i got upset seeing that meme go around as well the whole burn burnier than thou like mentality yeah i mean if you if, i mean if you really think that someone is mistaking the, the vibe of the event then the, the answer is to say hey i'm curious what are these pictures for or yeah. you know uh what's your backstory who are you i mean the number of of i know so many incredibly hardworking maker women who happened to look good in an awesome outfit and to to think oh they were clean and taking a photo shoot therefore they're not also a badass participant that makes the event what it is it's so it, it is 
And the number of people that actually justify that, even in these conversations where, you know, like arguing with me, yeah, but you could tell. You, I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? You could tell. <laughs> Think about that if you add any other surface judgment on someone. Yeah. Oh, I can tell they're a criminal. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Not just Sorry. Being a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I see the potential is so huge that when it gets corrupted or it gets, um, you know, poison, it, it, it's so difficult because it has so much potential. Like, it's like founding fathers. Well, maybe it's a bad idea because we still, it was a, we had a corrupt and a, a distorted sense of what America was. But even so, like any, at the beginning of any movement, any company, anything, you have this, this beautiful, raw, passion-based drive and it gets corrupted over time. But I think Burning Man, because of the way the 10 principles are crafted, it has the potential to fight off a lot of corruption, like decommodification. We do not allow people to bring their brand names in. We don't let companies sponsor it. So a lot of the things that often corrupt other forms of artistry or, or, or gatherings or anything like that, it, we are protected from it. But being able to, to protect the rest of it without damaging it. When I said like, don't get so caught up in protecting something beautiful that you become horribly ugly while defending it because then you ruin it too mm -hmm. and when you do see the i like i like what you said about like why don't you ask them like what are these pictures for it's like where's the, where's your civic responsibility uh right in reaching out to that person yeah <laughs> well and that's the thing too is it is it I think about my first year to burn, I got there on a Thursday. I was not a good campmate. <laughs> I didn't I didn't pull my weight with strike. I, you know, and so I try to remember who I was before I knew better. And who I became. You know, and everyone you meet that you, you think doesn't get it could be an incredible asset to the community if they are invited to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And this is true across the board, not just Burning Man. If you, whenever you see someone and you don't appreciate or don't like what they're doing and you attack them, you, the only choice you give them is to be the villain. Nobody wants to be the villain of the story. But if you give them an opportunity to be the hero, most people, I think, will find a way to do that. And that's, I mean, the other, that's a huge lesson for relationships too. You know, if you want to have your partner or partners or whatever to, to, do things that you like better don't force them to defend themselves give them the opportunity to be better so you know it would be makes you so happy just, oh my gosh i would i would be dancing if you had time later to help me with the dishes versus you never help with the dishes i never help with the dishes you well you never do this like okay now we're at war now yeah. And, and, and that's that's a risk at Burning Man as well as in so many parts of our our lives, I think. Now, with that being said, I often get attacked for being overly positive <laughs> because I do believe there are routes through things that don't require, you know, aggression and conflict. But since we're running out of time, maybe I'll we'll, we'll, <laughs> but, 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 we'll sidestep that. <laughs> yeah. um, we did get protesters this year at Pink Heart. People protested. Uh, the toxic positivity of pink heart <laughs> it was all a prank and it was in fun but yeah. it was not all in fun it was actually pretty biting Ew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, on the other hand i was there there was a certain pride to knowing that it, somebody noticed enough to prank us so it was, <laughs> uh, was it was it an organized thing it 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 was an individual that led it and made the signs and then recruited people by giving random, them beer. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, but since we are um, getting to the end of our discussion, I did want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about, uh, you mentioned, you started our conversation off by mentioning that you work to bring the lessons that you learn on Playa and at Burning Man uh, into the default world, into daily life. 
Uh, what are some of the ways that you work to do that? Let's see, the, 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 the way I've been doing it the longest is, I was gonna say Hug Nation, but Hug Nation really means a lot of things right now. So it began as being a weekly broadcast that was a lesson uh, from my life mm -hmm. that ends with a, a online group hug. And so I, I, I've, part of my art has been trying to really be self-aware of what I'm going through in life and seeking the lessons in it, it really helps me to 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 feel like I'm the protagonist, mm -hmm. which is the name of one of the books that you that you mentioned. Of, and from that place and sharing my lessons, it, it invites people to maybe see themselves in what they're going through. And I think that the, one of the th most healing things we can do is, as humans is recognize that we're not alone. And so that's part of my passion and, and path has been trying to bring those lessons, often 10 principles influence and Burning Man influence to these weekly broadcasts. And um, and then recently I've been doing uh, three live broadcasts a day. <laughs> One <laughs> in the morning, I do a love morning that is a Facebook live broadcast. And that started, well, actually, it, it basically it's an opportunity for me to say hello and I love you to everybody that pops in. And then I try to remind myself and others that we all have the ability to be love ambassadors. And I found that during the pandemic, I noticed that I was putting my head down and my mask on and going to the store and not looking at people and just, and, and I realized that my, my connection muscles were atrophying. Mm -hmm. And so for myself and for others, I, I wanted every day, I remind us that we have the ability to live in purpose in the most simplest of ways. I think too many people feel like, well, I'm going to make a difference once I, you know, get my act together or once I finish this training or once I, you know, figure out my trauma or it's like, you are fully qualified right now to be a love ambassador. And it's, it's not, you know, going to another country and digging a well that changes the world. It's every day trying to find the ways that you can be kind and say hello and say good morning. And then the more you practice that and the more you get over it when somebody doesn't respond the way you want to, and the more <laughs> you go, I'm gonna keep doing it. I'm gonna talk to other people and say, boy, I said good morning to this person. And they looked at me like this and you go, yeah, that does suck. Cause when that, when, when, when someone goes, oh, you're like, I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah, done. <laughs> I'm done, no more again. And so I try to have this kind of community support because when you start to just look for those opportunities, every once in a while, you get a bigger opportunity and then you get a bigger opportunity. And then you have these magical experiences happen. It, it, like a week or so ago, I was, I went to the corner liquor store to get some ice cream. Uh, I figured out, I wish I didn't learn this, but they have dairy free ice cream um, at the corner store. So I started to make a habit of going and kind of befriended the woman behind the counter and it was her birthday and she was working on her birthday. Aww. And I was like, as soon as I left with my ice cream, I'm like, I can give her a gift. I, Cause I was in love ambassador mindset. And so I w went home, got her actually copy my book. Which, uh -huh. I don't know if that's a gift or is that promotion? <laughs> I don't know. It was a gift. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I was like, that felt awesome. And I wouldn't have thought to do that if I wasn't practicing on a daily basis. And so it goes back to that gifting thing. Like, how did I make myself happier? I found an opportunity to gift and I wouldn't have seen it if I wasn't practicing. So that's another way. And then the, the, the other kind of big way that I, actually I'll get it. Okay, I'll tell two more ways. <laughs> um, another way is, um, again, this was inspired by the pandemic. Um, I do gratitude circles in Zoom every day. And, uh, where people come together, it's actually three times a day. I lead it at noon and six Pacific time. And then we have people that do it at three in the morning, which is noon European time. Yeah. And people, everyone shares like a minute or so of things that they're grateful for. And it's been, it, it, gratitude is not a specific principle of Burning Man, but this things that we're talking about of surrender and, and radical self-expression and gifting are all, I think, part of this mindset 
of shifting to seeing the good. And so a gratitude circle is another way that I've been practicing that. And most of the people there are connected to Burning Man in some way. Yeah. Not just Black Rock City, but 10 principles and this desire to be more self-expressive and to support people in, in their authenticity. And then the last thing I'll mention, <laughs> because I'm, I'm getting to a place in my life where I'm not apologizing for these things that I do in the world because I believe in them. Um, mm -hmm. The other one is I, I am a co-founder of a, a homeless outreach called First Saturdays that was um, created when I went to a high school reunion, connected with an old classmate who had become really a devout Christian. As we talked about the books we were reading, we realized that we, we talked about them in different words, but my desire to be of service through gifting was the same with his desire to be of service. And so we come together once a month and we give away donated clothes and care packs and uh, food to local people that are experiencing homelessness. We've been doing that for 12 years and I consider it to be a gifting practice ground. So it, <laughs> half of the event is intended to help people who are experiencing homelessness. Half of it is to, to show people how awesome it feels to gift. So that is, that is a, those are like some of the ways people, because a lot of people, you, 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 if you're not thinking in these terms, you do think, well, Burning Man is once a year. Like, no, yeah. it is a practicing ground where we scrimmage for once a year in a safe yeah. environment and hopefully build up our confidence and strength so we find ways to do it year round. Mm -hmm. And since I, 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 since I just mentioned those things, I'll say all of the stuff I do is available. The links to it are at links.hugnation.com as links to all my stuff. Thank you. And I'm going to practice gratitude um, by thanking you. I'm, I'm really grateful you joined me today. Uh, but I do want to open up the chat for any questions the viewers might have for you. Uh, so chat, let's go. Yay. <laughs> and while we while we wait for the chat questions to populate, uh, I'm going to do a dicey question segment. So I'm going to roll this D20 and ask you the corresponding question. First roll is a four. Uh, four, that's what... not my charisma. That's the question, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Uh, what is your favorite character in anything that's sci-fi or fantasy? Um, I guess the first thing that popped in my head is Ender of Ender's Game. Uh, love that story in the whole series. Um, really love i've listened to it a number of times i almost only listen to books now i don't mm -hmm. um i really love the the struggles of leadership and the the it's helpful for me sometimes to to read about the sacrifice that someone has to make and sometimes the challenges of uh of compassion and leadership are sometimes really complicated. Beautiful. That's on my list, but I have not checked it out yet. I know I'm Oh my God, it's so good. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna roll it again. Let's see. We got a 16. Um, do you have a zombie apocalypse survival plan? And if so, what is it? My plan is that I'm going to go quickly. <laughs> I, I, so truthfully, though, I mean, I, I have thought about that. Like, I am ill-equipped. Um, mm -hmm. However, and this is actually a... I have a number of friends who I consider to be, like, the people that will survive the apocalypse. And a number <laughs> of them have said, you're on our team. Like, we want you to help us with the community. You know, so my plan is to... Uh, be saved by my people who have better plans. <laughs> but, but I also like to be totally honest, like I have made my bet and I am spending very little energy in my day to day prepping for disaster, knowing that it could be my demise could happen when when things get to a place that is that bad. And I, I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, mm -hmm. that's, I know that's there's a you know, there, there's 
there is a, a uh, there's a lot to be discussed about um, the transitory nature of life, and the there are sacrifices to being to being prepared for disaster. Mm -hmm. I I don't blame anyone for that, but like I I don't spend a lot of energy. Uh, in a reality of potential suffering yeah. if I don't have to. Yeah. Uh, I always say I want to be patient zero because <laughs> I, yes. I don't want to do it. <laughs> like, yes. Let me go first. And <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I, I it's, it is, uh, it is a, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that. Cause I, I think that, that, that there often there is, a, I feel like a little bit of a, um, an apology with that answer but yeah that's i think there's, a th there's nothing wrong with that yeah we do have some questions that come in from the chat uh, yeah. so first question we have is as someone who's never been to burning man and doesn't really have anyone that would go with them what would you recommend for them great question um i would say look into your regionals and see if there is a regional around you attend that and even in the process of, of learning about it and seeing if there's groups in whatever social media that you do, if you can find a local group and ideally offer to help them with whatever it is they're building, whether it's a theme camp or a piece of art, because not only will you meet the community that way, but that's the best way to get a ticket. It's, it's very difficult to just decide to go to Burning Man and get a ticket, but the, the camps and art projects get tickets allocated to them. And if you become connected to them and ideally become necessary for their, their project, you will find community and you will find a way there. Yeah, I can I can second that because this year I had one of my campers who needed a ticket last minute and uh, the only way we were able to find it was through the networks that we had made through regional events and through regional meetups. So totally agree with that. Uh, another question we have is, uh, what's been your favorite camp to frequent at the burn and why? when you get out <laughs> i i mean pink heart yeah, yeah i mean there, there's there's so many different types of camps there's a there's a local based camp called ego trip that has really fun music i really love them um there is a camp that has a different name every year but it's foamy homies and they yes. have a, a group ceremony that is involves being sprayed as a group with foam and then being rinsed off and in a, the process that they put people through is so powerful. It is often for many people the first time that they're naked in front of strangers. And by the end of it, when you, when you leave the rinsing, they invite you to just stay naked and dance. And the, the experience of being cleansed and jangle jangle dancing around a bunch of people is so outside of the normal experience of the default world and so healing so i would say and unfortunately people realize how incredible it is so it usually is a very long Why? wait to get in there <laughs> um i'm also I mean, I know that, like i'm very blessed to be deeply connected with people so um uh sometimes when people know how little time i have away from camp they're kind to me as far as not having to uh, endure the same uh waits for things um again maybe that that, that, that that you could argue with me that that's a problem of burning man that you know that's that's a class system i don't feel that way i feel like if somebody comes to my camp that is spending their entire life leading the theme camp i'm going to try to get them ice cream quicker than someone who has all day to experience burning man mm -hmm. um but yeah i'll say i'll say ego trip and foamy homies yes uh and is there any event at the burn that you try to always make your way to? There's the, the pink ride that I lead on Thursday. Um, there's also a, a white procession that happens usually Thursday morning at sunrise and people wear white and then go to the temple and the Abraxas art car usually plays music at sunrise and people are all dressed in the ceremonial white. There's uh, a friend named Joshua leads a loss and grief um, ceremony. It's very sacred and gorgeous and beautiful. 
and uh, as well as fun. So I usually try to make it there Thursday at sunrise to the temple. I've never even heard of that. It's pretty rad. That's, yeah, that's gonna that's gonna go on my on my list. <laughs> um, some other questions. I, you have videos on YouTube talking about the burn and helping people understand and prepare. Where do you recommend people start with these videos? That's such a good question. I realize I'm like, <laughs> man, I do not make it easy for people. Um, I'd say uh, I have a, 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 all of them are kind of collected on a site at playaprinciples.com. And even then I don't really have a good playlist that takes you through it. I would say if you search on through my videos of, for gifting, that is the, the the best start. I also have one that's got virgins in the name that I, I go through a lot of kind of tips for virgins. Um, that is a great question. And I'll say that I will try to put some energy into making it easier <laughs> for someone. Cause I, 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 it is, it, yeah. I, I realize they go, oh well, yeah, watch one of my videos. Well, Which, where do I go? Yeah. Oh, it's hard. Yeah, it, it's, mm -hmm. um, I would say the, a virgin video and the gifting be the most most significant ones and then if there's if i usually I, i've got also i've got a number of videos where i just describe the 10 principles and that is another great place to just to just get a basic acquaintance of what they're about now I, these are me talking about it through my lens i am not the the arbitrator <laughs> of what the principles mean and, and how they should be followed um but sometimes just reading the descriptions of them isn't as clear as you might think mm -hmm. so uh i would say searching for 10 principles gifting and virgins on my site would be the good ones i make all my my new all my virgins watch the 10 principles one yeah <laughs> um so last few questions and then i'll let you go um what was your favorite gift given and received this year um The favorite gift that I gave is, um, and I need a little backstory on this. If you've not gone to Burning Man um, or to an event where you have to deal with porta potties, I am a big believer in pee jugs. So I always bring, and over the years I've felt, I figured out the best way to do it. It used to be Gatorade bottles. Now I bring a kitty litter, big kitty litter thing with a big wide mouth. Not just for people with penises. You, know, you, you can have a a, a, a Shiwi or other brand of a, a funnel so you can get your <laughs> urine into these containers and when you have the the need to go to a porta potty in the middle of the night it's so nice to be able to just have to go in your tent or when you're drinking as much liquids as you should be doing it's nice to just like have some place nearby that you can relieve your bladder now too much information it's not too much information. This is the kind of stuff that you're going to want to know if you're out there. <laughs> However, it also leads me to uh, the gift. So I also, because I've been doing this long enough time, I know that uh, something happens in 100 plus degree weather to urine. It ferments in some way and it becomes so... So even though you're dumping it, it's still something... It, it gets... So I created uh, Halcyon's pee jug solution, <laughs> which is... Um, I took the, the blue stuff that you see in the bottom of porta potties, put into little containers. And so every time you empty your, your pee jug, you squirt this little, little this in. So that became my favorite gift to Brilliant. give people this year. Brilliant. And then that I received, um, I have something over here. Um, I'm trying to blink. Um, I was given a, uh, a a medallion or like a, a a necklace thing that opened up in three panels, and in the middle of it, it was a place to put a little picture that I have not yet put a picture of either my grandfather or my three and a half year old bio son, and so I like that it's a a, a gift that also allows me to bring something special for me to it. So that's the first thing that popped in my head. And I wish in this moment, I can't remember the artist that made it. So I apologize. I often forget things like that. So thanks for <laughs> the patience with whoever gave me such a beautiful gift.
Wonderful. Uh, and then a question from November Leaves. Uh, base, besides your appearance on a certain hair dye box, uh, <laughs> what has been other inspirations for Pink Heart? Okay, so I have to explain the pink hair box. Uh, so, um, and if you, I'll say the name because it, it's funny, you should look it up online. Uh, splat hair dye is uh, probably the most popular and easy to get bright hair color. They sell it at like Walmart and Walgreens and Target. And I am on the pink box and I've been on it for like 20 years. I've had pink <laughs> hair for about 20 years. And the story behind it is that 20 years ago, not a lot of men had pink hair. It was a pretty unusual. That's the one reason why I did pink hair is because it forced, most people assumed that I was gay. I don't identify as gay, but I also don't like being identified based on my physical exterior. So I liked that it was a, a it confronted people's assumptions. And so I got an email from someone who said, I got kind of an awkward situation. I just got hired to redesign the packaging of this hair dye. And I pulled a picture of you off your Flickr stream and I use it in the mock-up to show the, 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 the team what it could look like. And they showed it to the executives and they said, we love it, print it, do it, go with that. And the reality is you never gave me permission to use this picture. And it, it's a self-portrait that I took of myself and then put on my Flickr. And, and so I went through this process of like, I could try to negotiate and get money for this. But if I ask for too much money, they'll just hire a model and do it. And what would it be worth to me to be on a box of hair dye? <laughs> and this was before Splat, I'd never heard of it. So it wasn't like, I, I, just, I just thought I'd get a few boxes of hair dye from this no-name brand and it would be a kick in the pants. Not knowing that years later, I would get an email about yeah. once a week from somebody who goes, dude, dude, I see you. So, it's become so awesome. I love it. I have no regrets. I made no money off it. Oh and um, it is just, it's, it, it will continue to be one of those weird claims to fame that some people, that's all they know me for. And, and it's, <laughs> uh, it's kind of funny considering how small a part of it is of the energy that I put into the world and yet how big it is for the, the, my presence. I like to mm -hmm. tell people like, you know, I am alongside the Jolly Green Giant and Orville Redenbacher. Like I am on the, the aisles of stores around the world. Like who else can say that? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> um, and then uh, our last question before we close out is just what are you most looking forward to next spring? trying again um, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to I really hope that we return to the Esplanade the, 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 the camp was designed to be on the Esplanade and if you're not Esplanade is kind of like the boardwalk it's generally the highest trafficked most high profile places for camps and uh, we were there for 11 years and really worked hard to role model what we thought was the the most important parts of being a, a camp and and so it was a difficult shift in expectation to to not be in that situation. I won't say lose because it's not a reward. It's just a, so we got to experience what it was like to be deeper in the city. That was filled with incredible lessons I could not have expected. Um, but I would, I'm really looking forward to returning to the Esplanade with a renewed appreciation for it and a renewed commitment to gifting to the city in, in, in the most dramatic way possible yeah uh, the pink card has always been my my direction setting so it was weird this year you're like i'm lost in a shoe yeah. hole like, <laughs> take up with with placement <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, i think that brings us to a great stopping point for tonight uh before we go is there anything you want to plug or any place we can catch you next yeah, I, I, I would love, I mean, there's a bunch of, all the things that I've mentioned are on links.hugnation.com and it's got my my book and it's got 
the daily gratitude circles. Uh, it's got, if you want to get a text message when I do my broadcast each day, the, the Facebook ones, um, the YouTube channel, a bunch of just, you know, I, I, I tend to spread myself a little thin. So, but that URL will give you kind of a bunch of things. And if you, you know, if, if anything pops up or you, you are curious about anything I said, or you have a story in your life that is related to any sort of personal expression or you're struggling with something. And I mean, I, if I have time, I would love to, to respond. I would love to hear from you. And um, yeah, I, I, I truly believe that the, the greatest gift that we have is our authentic truth. And, you know, sometimes people say, well, like, how do you say I love you to everybody when you don't know them? I'll say, I kind of do. Like, if you're a human being, then you are struggling with the same stuff that we're all struggling with. It might look different. Um, it might have different forms of it, intensity and different characters, but we're all doing the best we can. And if, if, if I, know that you're human in the best you can then i have this profound love for you so any way that i can be supportive in your journey i would like to do so with the recognition that some of that if it's not in one of these organized things that i do three times a day i'm doing free events if you want personalized attention i do offer coaching as well but any any way i can help people in their journey i, I really want to be dedicated to doing so Thank you again, Halcyon, for joining me. Uh, this has been, it's been a blessing to share this time with you and pick your brain a little bit. And thank you to everyone out there listening, uh, everyone in the chat joining in, everyone who has given us questions today uh, here at Goodberry Cafe. I hope that you've enjoyed your stay and I hope you'll check us out. Uh, next week, we have Forging Fates, our D&D actual play game returning uh, Monday night at 6 p.m. Pacific. 9 p.m. Eastern, same place. And Good Goodberry Cafe will be coming back in, I believe, the first week of November, but stay tuned to our socials for the next episode. But until then, I encourage you to follow and subscribe to our channel, join our Discord. And I hope you've enjoyed your stay, and I hope you have a very good night. Thank you. <laughs>